concept of this book, Darwin Among the Machines, is, first of all, it was sort of to update for the 20th century this essay that a very eccentric, brilliant, young man wrote in the 1850s. Samuel Butler wrote an essay called Darwin Among the Machines about how machines were going to become intelligent and take over the world. And then here we are, when I started writing that book, it was the 1990s, and, and everything that Sam, Samuel Butler sort of imagined was now coming true. All these computers are starting to speak to each other in their own language, and in, in a way, we think we're teaching the world of computers to speak our language, but in, in truth, it's the computers are teaching us to speak their language. We're sort of meeting halfway. And, and so I decided, you know, I decided to write the book that put this in a very deep historical context, sort of going back to Samuel Butler and even the people that he got his ideas from, and how did we get from there to the world of today? Where might it be going? His essay was written in answer to Charles Darwin, who had presented this marvelous theory, of, of, the, of course, which we accept now as beyond the theory of evolution and natural selection and how this applies to the world of organisms. And what Samuel Butler did was sort of take Darwin's theory and apply it to the world of technology and of machines. That machines would, would likewise evolve to a process of selection and mutation and that, that no one could say where the world of machines would go except that it was going much faster than biological evolution. And, and that's true. And of course now it's faster and faster. Yeah, because now we have not only evolution of machines, which was something that Samuel Butler clearly envisioned, but we have evolution of software, of codes, which is something that Samuel Butler did not quite imagine. So it's, it's, a, it's a good story. It starts in the 17th century, in the 1600s, with people like Thomas Hobbes and Gottfried Leibniz, a German sort of philosopher, mathematician. Leibniz imagined building a digital computer that ran purely on digital code. He didn't imagine it with electronics. He imagined it working with gravity and black and white marbles running down tracks, which is exactly what a modern microprocessor does, except instead of gravity, you have a voltage gradient, and instead of black and white marbles, you have pulses of electrons. But all the all the essential principles were there 300 years ago. We just sort of reality just sort of had to catch up. You know, where writing this particular book was placed in the technology is very interesting. Because I, I sometimes I think of Darwin Among the Machines as the last book about the internet that was written without the internet. I mean, I wrote that book in this in the beer cooler of this bar, this sort of walk-in cooler right there, uh, with no internet connection. Um, getting most of my sources uh, through interlibrary alone. Uh, it was a very different world then. I didn't, uh, Google didn't exist. There was a search engine called Alta Vista that, that you know, I could use through a text interface called Pine. I mean, it was, it was a very, very primitive world. So the internet existed, but it wasn't something you used day to day unless you were in a university or a, you know, in a military lab or so on. It was, uh, was it was a very different world, and then uh, I mean, in that book, for instance, there's, there's a chapter that that's probably the craziest chapter that talks about wireless and how ultimately all processors will be connected wirelessly. And of course, that's we take that completely for granted today. So it's the danger with writing, with writing books about the technology now is that technology changes so fast that even by the time your book is published, it may be obsolete. So it's a, it's a good strategy to write about the 17th century because you, you know, it's not going to go out of date next year. When I, when I began writing this book, I didn't, didn't, hadn't even read Samuel Butler's essay. And the fact that it was so prophetic surprised me. And, and then I had these views about digital codes as sort of evolving organisms. And then I discovered this, again, one of the heroes of the book is this Norwegian-Italian uh, mathematical geneticist Nils Baricelli, who the moment our first computer in America, our first high-speed computer became running, he shows up 
uh, asking to use it at night between midnight and, and 8 a.m. when the engineers come back to run experiments with the, creating an artificial digital universe and letting these codes evolve. Like I could never in my wildest imagination have, you know, have dreamed up that this had actually happened and that I would be able to find these documents and, and sort of make a story out of it. So no end of, and then another character in the book is Lewis Richardson, who was a British numerical meteorologist, sort of pioneered the idea of, of simulating the weather using computing. And he had gone, he was also a Quaker, had gone to World, into World War I to work in the ambulance unit. And, uh, and then there was a British science fiction writer, Olaf Stapledon, who believed in, which was the first, one of the first people to write about uh, distributed mind, how alien organisms might actually have their mind distributed through a wireless network of processors. And it turns out they, they were in the same ambulance unit. They were in the trenches in France together. Uh, you know, they had nothing to do between battles because nobody was getting injured. And they sat around and talked about all this stuff. And, and, and that was unknown that they had, uh, so lots of surprises. I always ask this question sort of who, because I write about these people like Johnny von Neumann or Alan Turing and, and, and people want to know who, you know, who's the next Alan Turing, who's the next, but you have to remember that Alan, you know, Alan Turing did his great work when he was 23 years old. And the same with Johnny von Neumann did his, uh, you know, these people did their great work in the 20s. So if you're looking for the next genius, it'll be somebody in their 20s who, you know, who's probably in another country, may not now even be able to get a visa to come to the United States. So it's, it's, it's impossible to pick these things out except to sort of wait 50 years and see who, who changes. But, but the world is ripe for, uh, for young new ideas to change the way we do computing. We, we, I think one of the tragedies is that we are still doing computing. We're completely locked into the world that was established in the 1950s. We haven't changed the fundamental way we do computation, and somebody could. Some of the greatest work in this story was, was done by someone who was, uh, you know, rescuing people out of the trenches in World War I and, and had these thoughts on their days off. You know, they were not a, a, in an academic, uh, you know, job. And, and I think that's true of a lot, you know, Einstein did his greatest work at the patent office. And so, so my view is remember the, the sort of ordinary people who had the extraordinary ideas uh, with, you know, without a great deal of support yet, yet persevered and, and their ideas came true.